Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Plato's Republic, Book 7, where he sets out this famous allegory of the cave, there is an incredibly important turning point in the story, which illustrates not only the case of Socrates, later on Plato's teacher, who will be charged with impiety and corrupting the young and executed by the people of Athens after doing philosophizing as a profession for decades in that town, but really any educator who comes in and is going to provide a consciousness raising and transformative type of education rather than the pseudo education that consists in filling people's heads with a bunch of data, information, facts, whatever you want to call it, that Plato is saying is not real education. True education requires a sort of turning from one thing to another and a type of elevation, a transformation of one's perspective and thereby of one's very consciousness, one's being, you might say, as a rational creature. So in this part of the story, the prisoner has been liberated and educated. They were taken from the cave where they were stuck looking straight ahead at a wall upon which shadows were cast. They could hear voices. They thought that that was reality. And with their fellow prisoners, they would make guesses about, you know, the objects, not even objects, just shadows of objects that they take as being real things in front of them and guess about which one will follow next or what they're going to do as best as they can. They even give prizes and have competitions about who can make the best predictions. And the prisoner was taken out, kicking and screaming, uh, takes a long period of, of adjustment uh, for their eyes, habituation, and you might even say a reconceptualization of just what the, the world is in front of them. Uh, you know, if you think about this, the learning spatiality, being able to move around and see things in a panoramic 360 sort of view as best as we can approximate to that would be mind blowing by itself. And so the, the person has now encountered real things in the world. And they've even looked at the heavens and the sun above that illuminates and generates and warms everything else. So they are in what Plato calls a very happy state. If they compare their former condition, being stuck in this cave below, to where they currently are, they find themselves to be blessed. They are happy. They are in a much better condition than they ever were. And Plato says that many people would just linger in that sort of state. He's, he's suggesting something like this for the people he's proposing as guardians of his ideal city later on in Republic Book 7. He says that you'll have to compel them to go back into the cave. In this case, though, with this prisoner, there's a somewhat different motivation. He recalls his original condition, how miserable it was to not know reality, and he thinks about his fellow prisoners, and Plato says that he feels a sense of pity towards them. And if you like, you know, if pity trips you up, you can substitute the word compassion that we use in our own times, a more positive term. There was no negative connotation to pitying the poor bastards down below in the cave uh, at the time of Plato. But our own language today often casts pity as something bad. 
So say compassion, he feels compassion towards them. And he thinks, how can I help them out? What can I do so that they can enjoy the same condition, the same contact with genuine reality that I enjoy currently? He doesn't value anymore the things that they valued, the things that he himself valued. He thinks those games that they're playing down below, they don't understand how stupid, how pointless, how trivial they are. They're not in contact with anything other than these shadows on the wall. Shadows were the very first thing that I actually had to learn, but they were shadows of real things. They're not even shadows of genuine articles of things down in the cave. They're not shadows of trees or persons. They're just shadows of puppets or stick figures, or whatever it is. So he doesn't value what, what they value. He doesn't give that uh, any sort of thought, other than how can I wean them away from this stuff? He decides to go back into the cave. He has to descend. And as he does so, he finds that he has trouble Seeing, And he might say, well, you should have known that, right? He remembered how bad it was going out of the cave. Well, this is his first time going back into the cave, isn't it? And Plato, a little bit later, reminds us that there's, there's uh, several different ways in which we can have disturbances of the eyes, as he calls it. He says, there's disturbances of the eyes according as the shift is from light to darkness or from darkness to light, but they both have the same effect. When we go from darkness to light, we are bedazzled and we have a difficult time actually seeing things in front of us. When we go from light to darkness, we similarly have a very difficult time until our eyes adjust. That's why if you you know are doing things at night and you're, say, in the military or uh, pirates, believe it or not, apparently wore eye patches for this reason, you'd cover one eye so that that eye will remain in darkness. And then you can see once you get into the dark, you know, situation like going under the, the deck in a ship right? Or going into a cave for this matter. This person doesn't do that. And so he goes down and he starts stumbling around. And, you know, the other prisoners are like, what what the hell's going on down here? And he says, I'm back. And they they say, now this is going a little bit further than Plato's account. Back from where? What are you talking about back? We just hadn't heard from you for a while. We thought maybe you were sleeping or something like that. He says, no, no, there's this, this entire world above And everything that you're seeing is really a deception or a poor imitation of the real things that exist. And this sounds very much to them like crazy talk. And understandably so. Because they have no other frame of reference. And so these other prisoners, they're still in a complete state of ignorance. They're they're not even uh, conscious of how badly off they actually are. They think that what they are engaged with is reality, the only reality. And all of this talk by this liberated prisoner is simply nonsense or craziness or something dangerous and deceptive in its own right. So as Plato says, they expect that he's going to sort of speak their language. They expect that he is going to engage in these games that they play of evaluating and guessing about the shadows. Which which shadow is coming next? And you can imagine his state of mind in seeing that. He'd be like, who gives a care what, what shadow is coming next? They're shadows. Don't you understand that these are not real things? You're being manipulated. You're being fed information, visual information that's actually inaccurate and untrue and perhaps random. Why are you trying to have these competitions? Now to the people in the cave, again, this sounds as if he's denigrating them as if he is saying that their way of doing things is no good. He is, in fact, saying that. And they don't like that. And it doesn't make sense to them. So what is their response? There's three things that Plato says that they do. One is to laugh at him. And Plato doesn't go on much further in talking about the laughter, except to say that if anybody really has the right to laugh, 
It's the guy who went up out of the cave and then came back down in. He's the one whose laughter would really be legitimate. Everybody else laughing at this, this poor guy who's stumbling around and misguessing because he's trying to jump through their proverbial hoops and reach them where they are to get them to something much better. They're laughing at him is really illegitimate. And it's just based on the fact that they're ignorant. They're not even stupid. They're just ignorant. They don't know the real condition. And one of the common typical human responses to people who, who bring up something new is to laugh at it. As a matter of fact, that may be essential to being human. Then, more dangerously for him, they think that the liberated person has actually managed to damage his own vision. So this is a, a bit more problematic. If you're being laughed at, they're not going to do anything to you other than laugh. But he seems like a dangerous sort because not only has he damaged his own vision, he's now proposing to take them out of the cave and thereby damage the vision of other people who think that their vision is perfectly fine. They can make out the shadows on the wall. He can't make out what the shadows are. And they don't want to be reduced in their capacities. They think that that's what he's proposing. So, the third thing that happens is they become violent and they, they threaten to lay hands upon him. And if they can, they will in fact kill this interloper who is coming in and spouting all sorts of crazy talk about a world above and real things. And that the way that they're living is not a genuine way connected with reality, who's proposing these radical measures the purpose and, and, under, and, and you might say scope of which they don't really understand. So if they have the opportunity, they will kill him. And this is an allegory for what happened to Plato's teacher Socrates. And it can be an allegory <clears throat> for anybody else who comes along and proposes a fuller, a more adequate, a better way of understanding reality that requires some stretching on the part of other people, people who go down into the cave to rescue those who, like them, were stuck in the cave of ignorance. So, like I mentioned before, Plato doesn't think that everybody who makes it out of the cave is actually going to be motivated to go back down in and free their, their fellow prisoners. This person is. He says that the guardians who are being educated in his, his ideal city will actually have to be forced to go back from the world of contemplating the forms and doing philosophy in its fullest extent to the more trivial matters, but very important matters of city management and, you know, deciding strategy and decision making about the material world that is. And the allegory, remember, is not just about people in the cave. It's a larger story about how we as human beings become far too preoccupied with these worldly visible material things and don't pay enough attention to their essences or forms that are the only real true things in a full sense. 